why are we here? Why are we here today? I mean, we're not here because we're having a good time. We're not here because California is the best place to live. We're not here because uh, the state acknowledges us or even listens to us or even cares what we think or what we want. We're not here because our state assemblyman cares what we think or want. And we're not here because the state senate cares what we think or want. And as we learned yesterday down at the Capitol, we're not here because the governor cares what we think or what we want. We're here because we want to find out through this effort whether the Constitution of the United States is the truth or a lie. And it has to be one or it has to be the other. The Constitution of California, the same thing. Is the Constitution of California the truth or is it a lie? And, and what we're asking ourselves today is, if we find that we don't have representation, what, what do we do about it? That, that's the important question, really, because we can find certain truths here, but we have to have some action. So I'm here to make a case for you for liberty. I'm here to make a case that we not only demand representation and we demand liberty, but we're entitled to it. And we should have always had it. And the reason that we don't is because the people that we elected don't know us, don't care about us, and we don't have the political power to affect events. So the first thing I want to say is, uh, my wife is always telling me, don't, don't spend too much time on history. <laughs> but, but Patrick Henry said, I, I have not but the lamp of experience to guide my feet. I can't possibly tell the future except by what is past. And Patrick was a pretty smart guy. And Thomas Paine said in a little pamphlet, oddly enough called Common Sense, that the first legislature in the colony should be held under the branches of a big oak tree. Uh, this, there would be about the number of people in this room. And everyone shows up and they discuss events and they discuss what's needed and what they like and what works and what doesn't work. They may come to some kind of agreement and everybody goes home. But then he went on to say that as the colony grows in population, representation must also grow for two reasons. First, so that every part of the colony remains represented adequately. And secondly, so that a representative can never form a separate agenda from those who elect him. And what we find is the bigger the districts get, and what, what uh, Patrick knew was, uh, uh, or what Thomas Paine knew, was the biz bigger the district got, the less likely it was that the person you elected would listen to you if you had a complaint, because he has so many constituents that your voice is lost in the crowd. And so now we come to the state of California, where an assembly district has roughly 500,000 people, and a senate district has roughly a million people in it. We have 40 senators, we have about 40 million people. We have 80 assemblymen, and we have about um, uh, 40 million people. So it's about half a million for one and a million each for the others. Now, the question that we're asking the court in the CFR lawsuit is, what's too many? That's, that's it. And it's a question that has to be answered. Because in the end, if you kick the can down the road a couple of centuries, and you say to yourself, well, if one for a million is adequate representation, what about one for two million, one for five million, one for 10 million? What happens when we get to a billion people in California if we project out far enough? Is, is one for a hundred million, is that okay? And we say, no, it isn't. Because it's obvious, even at one for a million, that you don't have enough representation. Uh, why is it obvious? Well, for many reasons. We can look at the national average, and California has the worst representative ratio in the United States, 350% worse than the next worst state, which is Texas. So we're 350%, our vote is 350% more diluted than state number 49. Ah, that's not good for us, because at one for half a million or one for a million, what happens if you have a genuine complaint? And it's real, and it and it's actually needs to be addressed, we'll say, we'll just, we'll postulate that. And you go to your state senator, and he says to you, well, I don't have face-to-face -face meetings with my constituents. What do you do? Well, the answer right now is nothing. We've actually had state senators tell Jefferson people that they don't have face-to-face -face meetings with constituents. When the time comes, if we ever can make it to court, what we want to do is FOIA their calendars. Because I'll bet you they have lots of meetings with people with big checkbooks, lobbyists, corporations, Monsanto, pharmaceuticals, Chevron, uh, CalSTRS, CalPERS, California Firefighters Union, California Teachers Association. I'll bet they have meetings all the time with those people, but they won't have a meeting with you. 
Now, we have, as Terry said, the Article 4, Section 4 of the United States Constitution, we have the right to a Republican form of government. In other words, the, the Constitution of the United States guarantees that in new states that enter the Union that you're guaranteed a Republican form of government. There's only one problem with that clause. Uh, that has been held many times in court that, that that is a legislative remedy. In other words, if we find that we don't have a Republican form of government, which we don't, you can't sue for it. You have to petition the legislature and have them fix it. There's just a problem with that. That's kind of like petitioning the fox and telling him to be careful in the hen house. And he's going to say to you, well, I don't, I don't see a problem. I think everything's working just great. And that's how it is in California. So let's go back a little bit further. When the Founding Fathers came here, they came here to avoid something, and that was tyranny. They came after the, the uh, Grand Remonstrance and the Glorious Revolution and the English Bill of Rights in 1689. They came here because the monarch in England was failing to follow God's law. Now, when I say God's law, I'm not talking about um, uh, church law. What I'm talking about is natural law. Those were the laws that people assumed to be God-given laws. And those were your inalienable rights. <clears throat> Excuse me. Those were your natural rights, what John Locke called uh, pre-civilization, or what William Blackstone said, pre-societal rights. In other words, uh, William Blackstone said that certain rights you have because you're born a human being. Um, the analogy I used at the Second Amendment rally yesterday was even a dog has the ability to defend himself, but you don't, because in California the Second Amendment's been banned. Even a raccoon can defend himself. Why? Because no one can stop him. He has claws and teeth and they're kind of nasty and when you push him into a corner they're going to bite you and scratch you and maybe give you rabies or something. But you as a human being don't have those tools. However, uh, William Blackstone said you were born free and independent and as such you enjoy certain inalienable rights. Well, oddly enough, that very sentence is found in the California Constitution in Article 1, Section 1. We were born free and independent beings. Why were we born free and independent? How does that work? That was God's law. That's the, that's the natural law, God's law, that the first settlers to this nation were talking about. Because God is the most free expression in the universe. Nobody tells God what to do. He's perfectly free. And so if you follow this logic as a religious argument, if you're a Christian like I am, but as a legal argument, if you're not a Christian, because the legality of this is very important, and that's where these violations come from. So let's follow this as a legal case or a moral case, however you want to take it. If God created you in his image, which the founders knew to be true, which I know in my heart to be true, I live that way every day, I believe that, I read the Bible every day, I see it all the time. I see it in each one of you and I see it in the world we live in. So if God was born free and independent and you were created in his image, then you also were born a free and independent being. And as such, you enjoy certain rights that are indelibly linked to you. William Blackstone said these were the natural rights or the pre-societal rights. You have these rights whether you participate in government or not. Because remember, to participate in society is not mandatory, it's a choice. When the colonists came here, when the first uh, people came and, and uh, started the state of California, they weren't saying, well gosh, I'm here, so I better find the government to take care of me. There was no government. There was no government here waiting for you to show up so they could subjugate you or tell you what to do. It didn't exist. The people that came here formed the government for a very specific reason. They did so because, as in the Mayflower colony and the Mayflower charter, they, they, what they outlined was that one man is only capable of certain things. One guy can cut down a tree, but one guy alone, without help, can't drag it over to build a cabin out of it. It takes many guys or some mechanical advantage, a bunch of mules or something. But what, what they were talking about is that several people, several families who band together with a common cause and with a common goal can accomplish great things that one man can't accomplish by himself. Not the least of which is the defense of the people involved. That's not the least of it. They can build things, they can create things. They can improve their lives. They can be more efficient. They can help one another when they need help. 
We can create farms and communities and hospitals. We can do things together that an individual can't possibly accomplish alone. That's why we have society. That's why we have civilization. Not because we like to live this close to our neighbor, but because it allows us to do certain things that we couldn't possibly do alone. However, in the formation of that society, we have to recognize certain things. Whether you like the smell of garlic or not, I'm going to use it on my hamburger sometimes. And I have the right to do that because I like it. I don't, it doesn't matter whether you like it or not. And you can't stop me from doing it because I'm an independent being and I have the right to say what I want to put on my food. And it goes further than that. I have the right, the God-given right, to defend the gift which he created. And that's my life. What good is your life if you don't have the ability to defend it? What good is your life if I can take it any time I want or anyone here can take it any time they want? How would it work for you if you lived in society or you didn't live in society if someone came to your cave or your house in town and stole your stuff any time they wanted to? And you not only lack the moral and legal authority, but you lack the tools to stop that. How long could you survive if someone came and took your things every week? How long could you survive if the government came and took your things every week? How long would you want to live in a society where there is no prohibition upon the government from coming into your home, violating your privacy and your property anytime they wish to for a rule that wasn't in place yesterday but was in place tomorrow? And if we don't like that rule, let's change it. It's not strong enough, so we'll make it a tougher rule the next day. That's not liberty, that's tyranny. So what Blackstone said was the principles of republic are defined by the inalienable rights. Those rights created by God, given to you by your creator at the moment of your creation, which are indelibly linked to you, indelibly uh, yours to use as you wish, and no one, no one has more authority than God, so no one can alter those rights, take them from you, cause you to stop using them, prevent you from using them. No one. That is the principle of liberty. Now, in that absolute freedom that God enjoys, we have to modify that. You have the freedom, by my logic, to drive 100 miles an hour down the road. But because we participate in society, we give up certain freedoms in order to ensure that the liberty that we hold most dear is protected. I'm not willing to drive 100 miles an hour because I might endanger you or you or you. So my freedom is tempered with morality. And that morality has to be objective. In other words, there has to be a standard of morality that is also immutable. That standard of morality can't be flexible. It can't be subjective. It can't be, I'm okay, you're okay, it's okay, it's all okay. If I think it, it's okay. If you don't think it's okay, it doesn't matter because I think it is okay. That can't be how it works. And that also is biblical. Because the roots of the tree of liberty are biblical. Whether you, whether you like that or not, I can prove that in a hundred documents, a thousand speeches, a thousand letters, and probably 10,000 books. It is biblical because the only objective standard of morality is the Bible, the Ten Commandments. We didn't get objective morality from Hinduism or Muslims or anything else. It is thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, don't lie, don't cheat, don't cheat your neighbor, don't steal his stuff, don't steal his wife, don't be jealous of the people around you, and so on. That is objective morality. These things are right, these things are wrong. People have rights. You have the right to self-determination, the right to self-defense. Let's go back to the government that wasn't created before us, that we created. As Blacktone said, people have rights. You have rights given you by God. Government is a construct. There was no government here before we were here. We created government to preserve liberty. So what is the logical solution here? What is the logical path that we have to take? Well, we have to make a distinction with objective morality that people have rights, but governments don't. Governments can't have rights. They're inanimate objects. They're constructs of the people who, who construct the government, who create the government. Here's the government of California for you. And I can prove this right now. We, the people of the state of California, grateful to Almighty God for our freedom, 
to secure and perpetuate its blessings, we establish this Constitution. What was the government before that statement was made? It didn't exist. It wasn't a government. It was nothing. That statement was the first step in creating the government. Why did we create government? To protect our freedom. No other reason. To secure and perpetuate the blessings from God that we call freedom. That's the only reason the government of California exists. Article 1, Section 1 of the California Constitution says we were born free and independent beings and as such we enjoy certain inalienable rights. What does inalienable mean? Inalienable mean, given you from God. Inseparable from you, the individual, no matter who likes them and who doesn't. It doesn't matter whether the town next door hates that right. It is linked to you forever and ever and it cannot be separated because of your individuality and your humanity. And that applies to all people. No matter what color you are, no matter what stripe you are, no matter what you believe. That was why government was created here, to protect your freedom. Article 1, Section 1 says so. Article 2, Section 1 says um, that all just political power, in other words, tyrannical power doesn't derive from anyone, although the government uses it. All just political power is derived from the people, not government. Government has no power except that which you concede to it. Government creates nothing. It only takes something from someone and gives it to someone else. All just power is derived from the people. Government was created for their benefit. In other words, once again, an acknowledgement that people created government for their own benefit, not for the benefit of government, not for the benefit of people who run government, for their benefit. And any time government fails to serve the people, it is their right to alter or abolish it as the public, any time the public good demands. That's Article 2, Section 1 of the California Constitution. So any time the public goods demand it, good demands it, you have the right to alter or reform government, not at the next election, not with an initiative three years from now, not with a petition any time. That is considered in the Declaration of Independence the right of revolution, if you will. The people created government. We have the right and the responsibility and the duty to deconstruct that government and reconstruct a better one any time the public good demands it. Being moral, legal, and ethical people, we've chosen certain pathways to that, to that same end. No one wants to fight. No one needs to. This is, if nothing else, we're constitutionalist, and when the frame, within the framework of the Constitution and the rights given us by Almighty God, there is a clear path forward. So what was that path for us in, C in Jefferson? First, we created a document called a declaration, a declaration to separate and withdraw from the state of California due to lack of representation and dilution of vote. What we're telling the government is one for a million is not good enough. It's not near good enough, it's not adequate, it's not even close to adequate. So we created a declaration and by hook or crook we got 23 counties on board with it. Some we went to boards of supervisors and they voted yes. My county was one of those, Lassen County was another one. Tehama County was another one but the supervisors didn't want to do it without a vote so they called for a referendum and we won the referendum. And that forced the supervisors to sign the declaration to petition and withdraw from the state of California. So we got 23 of those. Uh, Shasta County, uh, how many signatures? 45,000. And our goal was 51% of the, of the number of people that voted in the last gubernatorial election. The same standard is for a, a, a petition or a recall or anything else. And, they, and the people in Shasta County far exceeded that because their board of supervisors was tyrannical in nature. And when uh, when Carpenter and Terry and the rest of the group went in front of them, they not only said, we're not going to vote on this, they took a vote not even to listen to what the their people that elected them had to say. And they took another vote saying it would take a clear majority for any board of supervisors in the future to listen to the Jefferson pitch. So they not only hamstrung themselves intentionally, but they decided to rig the vote for the future as well. 
So what these guys did is they went out and worked their tails off. They got 45,000 signatures. And then when Carpenter walks into the Board of Supervisors and says, we are here to instruct you that the people of Shasta County have spoken. We are part of the state of Jefferson. We don't care what you think or what you want or what you vote for. The people have decided to take part in the state of Jefferson and you will be told what to do when the time comes by the people who elected you. I was just like going, wow, that is cool. I mean, that's the way to do it. You walk into the room and you tell the people who work for you how it's going to be. And they did that with legitimacy. They did that with legitimacy, with moral authority, and they did it in accordance with the California Constitution and the United States Constitution. Because the United States Constitution also says whenever, go whenever government fails to serve the people, it is our right and our responsibility to change the government. So that's what the people of Shasta County did. Okay, we got, we got 23 of these things through different methods almost in every county. And we lost in a couple of counties. Uh, we had a referendum in uh, Del Norte County, Measure A, I believe it was. And the Service Employees International Union spent... 50,000 bucks on that campaign, and we lost by 100 votes? 400 votes. We spent 500 bucks over there, because that's all we had. I mean, we're little and small, we don't have money, I admit that, it's, you know, that's, that isn't good or bad, it's just the way it is. But for 50,000 bucks, we lost by 400 votes. If we were smart, we'd go back there every single year, and after they'd spent about a million dollars, maybe they'd go away. But anyway, it's not over in Del Norte County, the character of the county is changing, we'll be back there. But we have 23. So we take these 23 declarations, and according to the California Constitution, the process and procedure available to us, we go down to the State House, we record them with the Secretary of State, which puts it on the record. We go to the Senate Pro Tem and the Speaker of the Assembly, we submit these declarations, and then we ask them, the uh, Ledge Council and the Speaker of the Assembly, we want you to make a copy of each and every one of these declarations and provide a copy to each and every member in this body because we want discussion on this and we want a state split under Article 4, Section 3 of the United States Constitution. Article 4, Section 3 is a process outlined by the Founding Fathers that makes it legal, moral, and ethical for, to add states to the Union or to separate states into more parts than they had before. And, and it's been done before. Uh, Vermont separated from New York, Maine from Massachusetts, um, Tennessee and West Virginia from Virginia. So this isn't anything new, it's been done before. Now Article 4 is very clear. It, said, nor, it says, nor shall, a state, nor shall a state be created from the territory of an existing state or to adjoining states unless the state legislature affected agrees and Congress agrees. So we have to ask the state legislature, unfortunately, we're going to go ask the fox if the chickens can leave the coop, and we have to ask Congress. Now, our numbers in Congress are good. I mean, not in the House of Representatives right now, but that might change. But our numbers in the United States Senate, we could win this. We could have won it in the last Congress, but we fell asleep and nobody voted and we lost control of Congress, conservatives did, so we've got to go get that back again somehow. That's the work the people have to do to make this, this cause a reality. Well, well, so we submit these declarations. Then after that, we didn't hear much. In fact, not one single legislator, not even our own champions of liberty that they are, made one single phone call to find out what we wanted or why we wanted it. Not one. I mean, the silence was deafening. So we started a campaign, email phone call. We had a website where you could get five different phone numbers of legislators every single day, and we asked every person in Jefferson to at least call five of them every day, and some of us called all of them every day. There were literally hundreds of thousands of phone calls, tens of thousands of emails, thousands of personal visits, and after all of that, not one single legislator, not even our own, made one single phone call or sent one single email to find out what we were upset about, what we wanted, or why we wanted it. Not one. So I'm saying to myself, wow, this is bad. And then I'm saying to myself, no, it really isn't bad because it proves a point. They really don't care what one third of the land mass of California thinks. They don't care what 1.2 million people think. 
And you know what? They don't have to. They don't have to. Why? Well, the California legislature, let's do an arithmetic problem. California legislature has 120 members, 80 assembly, 40 senators, right? The state of Jefferson, depending upon how you count them, it, it, the number could go either way because some assemblymen share counties that are part of Jefferson, but they also share part of a county that isn't in Jefferson. So by a fairly uh, accurate count, the northern third of California has six state level lawmakers. And lower California has 114. In fact, 51% of the representation in California from, falls from the northern line of Los Angeles County south to the Mexican border. 51%. If the counties from Los Angeles south want something, they can win every vote every time they want, no matter what anyone else wants. And it doesn't matter what you think or what you want. How did that happen? How did that happen to us? So let's go through this a little bit more first and I'll tell you how we got here. Um, so we did that, we did the declaration deal and we got nothing out of it, not even one response. Not, in fact, that's where we found out that a lot of state legislature, legislators won't even meet with their constituents. They don't have face-to-face -face meetings with the people that vote for them. You're not important enough and you can't affect events. So let's ask ourselves another question. What's enough? All right, so if you want to impact events, and there are one million of you in a district, could the people in this room possibly mount a campaign by themselves with just the money in our pockets to affect events? Absolutely not. And what do we have, 100 here maybe, I'm just guessing. So one for a million won't help us. What about one for half a million? Same. What about one for 250,000? No, not, not working. And in fact, it works so poorly for the people of California that 98% of all elections, you can't get rid of an incumbent. Because once he's an incumbent, he or she, you can't get rid of him. 97% of all elections, the incumbent wins for some reason. Challengers don't have a chance because the district is so large they can't get the money. Or like Patrick, he could not spread himself thin enough to cover all of those counties with the money that it took so that the, all the people in those counties even knew who he was. I mean, you've got to tell 500,000 people who you are. How can the average guy do that? And the answer is he can't, and Thomas Paine knew that, and he said so. He said representation must grow as the colony grows so that all parts of it remain represented in his pamphlet called Common Sense. You can't possibly do it with the numbers we have. So now let's keep going. What about one for 50,000? Well, that's a little bit better. That'd still be pretty tough. What about New Hampshire? One for every 3,700 people. Wow, do you know how much a political campaign cost in New Hampshire? A thousand bucks. You go pay your filing fee, and the guy fills his car with gas, and he goes out and he knocks on every door he possibly can. He introduces himself, he explains who he is, he goes to neighborhood caucuses, he goes to dinners with his constituents, he explains his position, he finds out what they want, what they need, and he tells them whether he can help them or not. In other words, he is being interviewed for the job. And they can do it, because there aren't very many people. Let's say we were in New Hampshire and, and we were really angry at our representative. Do you think a couple hundred people or a hundred people could get that guy kicked out? Yeah, you betcha. It'd be easy. Because all we'd have to do is go knock on 10 doors each and make a good case, wouldn't we? That's adequate representation. Is New Hampshire perfect? I don't know. I doubt it. But do people have a voice? Absolutely, they do. The founders of the state of California intended this for, for you. And they put this into practice. One state senator for every 6,000 people and one state assemblyman for every 2,500 people. They thought that was adequate. And there were only 400,000 people in California then. If, if the population of California then was now, there wouldn't even be one person in government. The governor would take care of all of it because that's not even one for half a million. But then they knew that geography mattered too. That your home is different from homes in the city. That your home in the desert is different from homes in the forest. That you need and want different things than your neighbors who, who farm row crops than the neighbors who, who mine or, or log. 
and geography and community deserves representation too. And at one for six and one for 2,500, you could do it. And if you accidentally elected a bum or a crook, it would be cheap and easy to get rid of them at the very next election. I don't care what your politics are. It doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or Republican, a Libertarian, an American Independent. If you accidentally elect a bum, it's cheap and easy to get rid of them if the districts are small enough. So the court says to us, well, what you want is injusticable because we don't know how to fix that. And I, I'm going to get to that in a minute because that argument to me is indefensible. What the government of California is saying to you is it is no longer convenient to adequately represent you because there are more of you now than there were yesterday. So we went through all of this declaration process and, and we got nowhere and so we sued them. We sued them for lack of representation and dilution of vote. We sued them in federal court because uh, Edward Koch said in about 1680, he said all courts are corrupt. All courts are corrupt because the judge knows who pays them. So you never sue the state of California in state court because you're going to lose because the judges are all corrupt. You'll lose against the state every single time and I watch it through a lot of cases. And I used to be a deputy sheriff so I've been in court quite a bit and you lose every time you sue the state in state court. So we had to find a way to sue the state in federal court because we were hoping federal courts would be less corrupt than state courts over state matters. We, we got in there and we sued for lack of representation and dilution of vote. And the first thing the judge said to us is, you don't have standing to sue the state in federal court. We're like kind of going, wow. The people who form the state of California don't have standing to sue the state for failing to represent them. That is tyranny. That is tyranny. The court also said, and here's how courts take your liberty every single day, and I've seen this before, the court also said, uh, well, this is a general harm. If you don't, and, and it's interesting, because in this lawsuit, the state has never argued with us. They've never said, not once, that what we're saying isn't true. They admit everything we're saying. No, you don't have enough representation. No, there are far few, too few representatives in, in the state house, but it doesn't matter. Because since everyone is harmed equally, there's nothing the court can do for you. Now, let's imagine communist China when Xi Jinping went to the Communist Congress and he had himself made president for life. He just did that. He is now a dictator. The legislature voted on it. They said it was okay. He is now having the people in Hong Kong killed and drug off to prison. He's got a quarter million Muslims in concentration camps. Christians disappear off the streets every day, never to be heard from again. Let's imagine that China had a court where they could find justice. You know what the court would say? Yes, you live in a dictatorship. Everything you're saying is true. Uh, Ping is a murderer, a mass murderer, probably a pedophile too. I don't know. But since everyone in China is equally harmed by this tyranny, we can't help you. That's what the court is saying to you right now. They're saying they won't help you because the harm is general. And what we're saying is no, it isn't. Because the legislature in, in California was capped in 1872 at 40 and 80, and here's why. The theme of the 1879 Constitution, that's the Constitution you live by right now, was get rid of the Chinese. And they stopped growing the legislature in 1872 because they were afraid that the Chinese population might grow enough that they could get a state representative, and California didn't want that to happen. In fact, Article 19 of the California Constitution in 1879 was, it's a felony to hire a Chinese person. That stayed on the books till 1952. So we're telling them that the harm is not equal, it's ge is not general, it's individual as well. Uh, Citizens United versus House of Representatives tells us that you have, you as an individual, have a material interest in maintaining the value of your vote. Your vote matters. It matters at a certain weight. When I was uh, first able to vote, California had 20 million people. My vote's been diluted by 100% since then, because now there are 40 million people competing for the same attention that there were only 20 million people competing for before. How did we get to this place? There are three Supreme Court cases that got us here. The first one was Baker versus Carr, 
and I'll just run through, through these quickly. That is where the federal court gave itself the power to intervene in state elections. Wow, that's crazy. I've read the Constitution. I've got it right here in my holster a million times. This is my weapon, Constitution. I've read this a few times, you can kind of tell. And in Article 3, the section on courts, it doesn't say anything about the federal court being able to change the rules for the people who wrote this. Why? Because government didn't create us, we created government. We created this government. We wrote this. The states were the signatories to it. The states created the federal government, not the other way around. Can you imagine buying an automobile and you sign the car contract and four months later the car shows up at the dealership and says, this guy never puts air in the tires. I want out of this deal. I want to change the contract. The automobile is the object created by the contract. It is the, the thing of value for which the contract was written. The car didn't create the people who bought it. It bought it. It was the other way around. The people who bought it created the contract. Who has the authority to, to change a contract? Only the people who wrote it. So the states created the federal government, but now the federal court turned to the states and said, you don't deserve state sovereignty because the federal government is going to tell you how to elect state officials. Wow, that was crazy. But Chief Justice Earl Warren, he was a governor of California. He was the uh, attorney general of California, and he also never read the California Constitution. Never read it. And I can prove that because he said, Counties do not deserve individual representation because they're political subdivisions of the state. They're not legal subdivisions of the state. Well, in California, Article 11, Section 1 says in the first line, counties are legal subdivisions of the state. So he affirmed an opinion that was diametrically opposed to the constitutions of 38 states that it impacted and changed the way states elect officials forever. The court made this mess. In Gray versus Sanders, the Supreme Court created the principle called one man, one vote. California in 1928 passed Prop 26, and that was called the federal plan of government. How many senators do every state in the union have? Two. Wyoming has less than a million people. It has two United States senators. California has 40 million people. It has two state senators. Every state has two senators. It's called the Connecticut Compromise. So that smaller states and states that were geographically further away and geographically less populated or less affluent or whatever would still have some say over how the government was run. That's how it was in California from 1926 all the way up until 1964 when this case hit bottom. And guess what? California worked because we had checks and balances. The urban counties that had the masses of people could not do stupid things unless the rural counties who had the control of the uh, state senate agreed because every county had a senator. And California worked. We had less than $5 billion worth of long-term debt from 1928 all the way up to 1964. We were building freeways and highways and cities and towns and people were happy and we had jobs. We had money and the economy was growing. And in 1964, Chief Justice Earl Warren, who General Eisenhower said was the worst damn fool mistake he ever made in his life, because he appointed him, and he said that he created the principle of one man, one vote. What he said was, in all state elections, everyone will have one vote and all state's officers will be elected by districts that are roughly apportioned with equal pop population. That was the end of one state senator per county. So now we have a situation where the assembly and the senator just rubber stamps for each other because the same people elect them. We also have a situation now where a state senator, state senate district one, there's 11 counties. State senator in district one has 11 counties. Los Angeles County has 15 senators because of the population. So, and what the chief, what the uh, dissenting justice Frankenfurter said about Gray versus Sanders, he said, if we do this, if we do this, if we dare do this, it will create a nation with an entirely city point of view. 
And Alex de Tocqueville argued against that because he said the unbridled power of the mob can't be overcome by smaller communities. And he went further to say the greatest form of government known to man was the township, which in those days was one square mile. Now it roughly equates to a county. Because government works best from the bottom up, not the top down. And once again, Thomas Paine said every part of the colony must remain represented. So, then, so now we have Gray versus Summers, one man, one vote. That, that doctrine was created by Earl Warren in the Warren Court. Then we move on one more case because what Warren said was, if, if we, once we've done this, the Gray case, he meant, no one will ever challenge the federal court again. And if they do, we'll come down hard on them. Well, 30 court challenges later, the last case, which was Reynolds versus Sims, and Warren was just plain mad at you for objecting to the tyranny he turned the United States to. And here's what he did in Reynolds versus Sims. He said, he said to himself, I am going to put a nail in this box that no one will ever get out. So what Reynolds versus Sims says is all state elections, all state elections, will be conducted under apportionment schemes approved by the federal court. That was the end of state sovereignty forever. It was the end of the equal footing doctrine. It was the end of your ability to change the course of your state. Because now we have pure democracy in California. As we know on the federal level, that is nothing more than mob rule. A reporter asked me yesterday, he said, well, you know, in our democracy, he was talking about guns. In our democracy, and I corrected him, he's a young guy. I corrected him. I said, we don't live in a democracy. Oh, yes, we do. I said, no, we don't. I said, during the French Revolution, they had pure democracy. And what they did was, with a 51% vote, they legalized murder. If 51% of the people want to kill everybody in this room, all they have to do is vote, right? They whipped out the guillotine, and they killed about 30,000, 40,000 people with it. But they voted. It was okay. They voted to kill educated people, rich people, oh, and people that didn't agree with them. Because in a pure democracy, if you don't agree, you're the enemy. And we can take a simple vote and fix that. You, we don't want you to have guns because you're conservatives. I'm oh, 51% of the vote. And your guns are gone, your rights are gone, your voice is gone because you're hate speech with 51%. Every single one of you is a target and all it takes is 51%. But here's how constitutional republic works. The rights of the minority may never be taken from you as inalienable as they are by the majority, no matter who the majority is and no matter who the minority is. That's how constitutional republic works. And our state doesn't work like that anymore because of Gray, Baker, and Reynolds. So here we are in court. We go to court, the judge says, you don't have standing. We say, yes, we do. She says, no, you don't. We say, yes, we do. She says, no, you don't. And she finally dismissed our case with prejudice. So now we're appealing to the Ninth Circuit Court. Now, this is a problem for us. It's a big problem because here's how we had this planned. We approached the court under United States Code Title 28, Section 2284. And, and that says that any case that is dealing with lack of representation or dilution of vote must be handled by a three-judge panel because no single judge can be trusted with the vote of the people. No single judge. It's too precious. Your liberty is too precious to trust to a single judge. And a Supreme Court case, Shapiro versus McManus, not instructs, but directs every federal court judge to this behavior. And that is that whenever a case is comes before you that is either lack of representation or dilution of vote, you have but one duty, one. And that is to appeal to the chief magistrate of your district and ask him for two more names. There is only one exception to that, and that is if you find the case to be frivolous or without merit, then a single judge may dismiss the case. Well, here's the problem that the judge has. We asked her in open court. Uh, Scott Staffney, our attorney, asked her, Your Honor, do you think this case is frivolous or without merit? Shapiro v. McManus. She says, Oh, absolutely not. I think this is a very serious question and needs to be answered. Then she said to the state's attorney, Waters, she said, Mr. Waters, do you think this case is frivolous or without merit? Oh, absolutely not, Your Honor. This is a very serious question. 
So she admitted in open court that we made the bar in Shapiro v. McManus, and we deserve the three-judge panel. Now, here's the, here's the good part for us, uh, Title 28, 2284, and we knew this in advance. This is why we did it this way. Says that the result of any action involving a three-judge court, primary jurisdiction for the appeal is the United States Supreme Court. There is no cert process. Everyone's entitled to an appeal. So in a 2284 case, you skip the Ninth Circuit and you go straight to the Supreme Court and they can't say no. And we got this plan from the Abbott versus Evenwell legal team and they did it. They actually did that. And they went straight to the Supreme Court. We did everything they did. We did everything they asked us to do in order to make this plan work. But here's the problem. What our judge did was she when we first went into court, she right away gave us the three-judge court. Okay, well, I'll, I'll get a three-judge court going. And a week later, she changed her mind. Now, our attorney, Scott Staffney, Gary Zerman, and Judge Alex Kaczynski, who used to be the chief magistrate of the Ninth Circuit Court, he's probably the only conservative on the court, truly, uh, they said, well, wait a minute, Your Honor. In the annals of American history, there has never been a judge that issued a call for a three-judge panel and then asked for a do-over later. You can't do that. There is no legal process for you to change your mind once you ask for a three-judge court. And here's what we think happened, because the judge admitted it. She said, well, I called for the three-judge panel, and then I had communication with the Ninth Circuit Court, and they advised me not to do that. Well, think about it. She asked a court that had not been briefed on the case, did not know the merits of the case, had never read the case paperwork, weren't in the room when the case was being argued, and based upon their advice, she changed her mind. Well, we think that's not only illegal, but it's unconstitutional. Now, here's where it created a problem for us. It's about a $100,000 detour. We weren't planning to go to the Ninth Circuit. We were planning to go from trial court state straight to the Supreme Court. So now we're 400,000 bucks into this thing and we're not going straight to the Supreme Court like we thought we would. We're in the Ninth. What we hope for in the Ninth, and it hasn't been calendared yet, but it will be soon, we hope that the Ninth Circuit will realize that Judge Mueller acted inappropriately and unconstitutionally and they will remand the case back to her and instruct her to call for the three-judge panel, and then we're back on plan. Now look, we are going to lose in front of Judge Mueller. We already know that. We knew that right from the beginning. We knew it before we filed the case. She's a Democratic operative. She's a buddy of Daryl Steinberg's. Her family ranch is right next to Jerry Brown. She was on the uh, Sacramento City Council. She went to law school in San Francisco. We knew we were going to lose in front of her, but our justice won't come from her anyway. It'll come from the United States Supreme Court. And look, whether we win or lose in front of Mueller, if we win, the state is going to appeal to the Supreme Court, and they can, three-judge panel. And if we lose, we're going to appeal to the Supreme Court, and we can, three-judge panel. So our only hope for justice is in front of the United States Supreme Court. And remember also, once you go to appeal, Facts, in e facts not in evidence can't be argued. So if the state doesn't say, no, you're wrong, and the state's never said this, they've never said, oh, you have plenty of representation. They've never said that. Well, if they don't make that argument at trial, they can't make it in front of the Supreme Court. It's too late. So we will have a case that essentially is unopposed because we're the only ones arguing the merits. They're just saying you don't have standing, you shouldn't be here. They're not even saying we're wrong. They're just saying you don't belong here. So that's where we are with the CFR case, and we need your help. I mean, we've got 30,000 bucks left. We need 230,000 bucks at a minimum. And a lot of us are giving everything for this. Uh, um, if you can give something, please do, because we won't win. And, uh, you know, there were $1.2 million in Jefferson. I think it was Patrick that said if everybody in Jefferson just gave five bucks, we'd, we'd win. But we're, we're not successful at that. There are people that are asleep. There are people that don't care. There are people that are fine being chained to their master's table and satisfied with the scraps that the governor flicks off that you get to keep, because that's what it is. You know, he knows you have a nickel in your jeans somewhere, and he's, he's going to get it. You pay more for gas than anybody in the nation. 
You have less property right than anyone in the nation. You have less privacy than anyone in the nation. We spend more on schools and have the worst schools than 48 other states do. We spend more on roads and have worse roads than 47 other states do. And he's looking for more. He's going to tax the water that comes out of your tap. He's already taxing my water right that's 150 years old. Now there's a new tax coming. He is trying to get rid of diesel tractors. I don't know how I can plow a field with an electric tractor. I guess you have to plug it in after every pass. I mean, these things are just stupid. They're just plain stupid. He's got a carbon tax now. Carbon taxes are the most torturous taxes in the world because they affect the people most that can afford to pay them least. People who are affluent don't care if gas is six bucks a gallon. They'll just jump in the private jet so they don't have to buy gasoline and use diesel instead. I mean, you look at Prince Henry. He's whining about carbon footprint, and then he jumps in his jet to go to France, produces 114,000 pounds of carbon, so he can go talk about how bad the carbon footprint is from you. And you should stop eating meat. Because he can't fly around in a jet if you eat meat. I mean, that's not good for the environment. Those are the things that are happening in California. The outlaw of all fossil fuels by 2030. A governor who doesn't care what you want. A legislature who doesn't care what you want or are powerless to stop it. And you know, we have champions like Patrick. I mean, you know, God bless him. He put himself out. And as much as we wanted to believe and as hard as we worked, he probably didn't have a chance because a half a million bucks in a special election? Really? I mean, who does that? People who don't care about the money. That's who. CalPERS, CalSTRS, California Teachers Association, California Nurses Association, uh, uh, Service Employees International Union, the unions that own this state and own you, because they do. They own you. They own you lock, stock, and barrel. And right now, I used to say, you know, it's important for us to try to hang on to this liberty. And Winston Churchill said, if you won't fight when it's easy and victory's assured, you'll be forced to fight when victory's in doubt and many will die. And if you don't fight when victory's in doubt, you may be forced to fight when there is no outcome except whether you will die free or a slave. You're going to die, but if you die fighting, you're free. If you allow yourself to be captured, you're a slave. I think we're somewhere pretty close to stage three in the state of California, but we can still win this because we have hope that the United States Supreme Court, thankfully, has shifted more toward the conservative side. And when I say conservative, I don't mean Republican. I mean it how Edmund Burke meant it. People who conserve their liberty. That's what conservative is to me. I don't claim affiliation with any party. I'm a constitutionalist. That's my party. My party is the Bible and the United States Constitution. But I want to conserve that liberty because I want to conserve the gifts that God gave me and I don't want to squander them. I don't want to go to heaven and talk to every veteran from Valley Forge to Tarawa and apologize for squandering the gifts that they paid for with their blood. I don't want to do that. And John Adams said, liberty must at all hazards be supported. You have a right to it. Derived from your maker. And even if that were not so, it was bought and purchased for you by your fathers with their ease, their estates, their treasure, and their blood. You have been given a tremendous gift. Will we be the generation that declares that our creation has now become our master? Will we be the people that squanders liberty forever? I say no. I, I say no matter what course others may take, as for me, Give me liberty or give me death. And along those lines, if you guys have a little bit more patience, I'll give you, Terry wants me to give you a quick update on the Second Amendment case we have going against the state of California because once again, they're trying to tyrannize us and strip us of our liberty. What California has done, in spite of the history, in spite of the law, in spite of the Constitution, they have passed statutory bans on the Second Amendment. We have concealed carry in 58 counties where the, the state has delegated the authority to some sheriffs to decide who may carry and who may not. 
What does the Second Amendment say? The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It doesn't say the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall be given to the sheriff to decide whether it's okay or not for you to do it. But that's what they've done. And so there was a case, and I'll go quickly through this. I know we're all getting tired. There was a, a case, uh, Prudhoe v. San Diego, where the court held that concealed carry is not a right. It's a permission. States can ban it. States can outlaw it. States can regulate it. They can do whatever they want. So we won't talk about concealed carry anymore because as the court found in Peruta, the Second Amendment falls wholly outside of concealed carry. Concealed carry is not a right. If there is a right under the Second Amendment to carry, it must be open. So open carry, and that means open and exposed, is the only right you have under the Second Amendment. Everybody thinks the same thing. Well, isn't it tactically superior to have concealed carry and have the element of surprise? Yeah, you know, maybe. Depends on the circumstances, depends on where you are, who you're with, uh, what you have, what's going on. But it doesn't matter because it's not your right. It is a permission that may be granted to you and may not be. Open carry is your right, so we got to deal with that. That's the way it is. United States v. Cruikshank says the Second Amendment is wholly undependent on the Constitution. It predates the Constitution. It is unconnected with malicious service. It is an individual right for self-defense and preservation against tyranny. Uh, hunting is not used in a sentence. You know why? Because in the founding era, everybody hunted. If you didn't hunt, you didn't eat. The Second Amendment had nothing to do with hunting. Everybody hunted. It had to do with the right, the natural and alienable right for you to defend your life, your family, your, your home, your community, your state, and your nation, and to defend yourselves from tyranny, a tyrannical government. Of the people in Hong Kong right now protesting for liberty, they're waving American flags, they're saying the American Pledge of Allegiance, and they would wish to God they had a Second Amendment because the police are coming and dragging them off the streets and they will disappear and they will be killed. And the Chinese Communist Party will send the army in at some point and they will stomp those people to death because liberty is as fatal to their philosophy as the plague was in England. They cannot have liberty. And those people have not the tools to defend themselves against tyranny. Well, in California, Penal Code 25850, 26426, 350 bans the open carry of a loaded or unloaded weapon. It's banned. Concealed carry isn't a right. Open carry's been banned. So we sued them. And you know what the California's response to that was? We can't, I'm trying to remember verbatim, I'm, I might miss a word or two. We can't possibly grant the relief that the plaintiff is seeking because it would be impossible for us to grant access to open carry to all lawful individuals because it might upset the carefully constructed and delicately balanced system of regulations designed to protect individual liberty, that one struck me, and maintain order. Well, they're protecting your liberty by banning the Second Amendment. That's protecting your liberty to them. But maintaining order, let's ask ourselves about that for one second. Criminals don't obey the law. That's why they're called criminals by their very name, and that's in our, in our motion. By their very moniker, they don't obey the law because they're called criminals. Lawful individuals, by their very moniker, by their name, obey the law. They're the only ones that obey the law. Criminals don't. So if you ban the Second Amendment, access to the Second Amendment to lawful people, who is it you're maintaining order over? You. That's who. They're maintaining order over you. What have you done to deserve that? Nothing. And the state further says, in 600 years of Anglo-American history, it has never been within the Second Amendment to grant the access to open carry to the average citizen. Wow. That flies in the face of history. I remember on April, I wasn't there, but I remember reading about it. On April 19, 1775, 70 men went behind the closet door under the bed over the hearth from the kitchen, and they got guns that they already owned and bullets that they, and ball and powder that they already had, and they walked outside their home, 
And they went down to the green, and they stood in the green to defend themselves against 700 troops from their own government who came there to kill them and disarm them. They did not defend the country from behind the bedroom curtain. They were not carrying their gun from the bedroom to the bathroom. They weren't shooting through the kitchen door. They went out into public openly and exposed with a firearm to defend themselves against tyranny and the rest is history. So to make that statement in court is a lie. And this state lies all the time. And I don't know about you, but I'm sick of it. And I'm going to do something about it. Then further, let's take a look at the state of California. When Spain had dominion over Alta California, the state of California, there was no prohibition whatsoever in carrying any kind of weapon you want. In fact, private citizens were allowed to own cannons and pirate ships all the way through the Revolutionary War and beyond. In fact, during the Civil War, private individuals owned pirate ships with cannons on them and multi-shot weapons and pepper boxes. And there were also semi-automatic weapons then, the Giardini and a couple others. And Patrick probably knows the names of those better than I do. But at any rate, so when Spain owned Alta California, you could carry a gun, nobody cared. In fact, everybody did it if you wanted to stay alive. When Mexico owned California, there was 30 years there between Spain and the California Republic that Mexico had California. There was no prohibition whatsoever from carrying any kind of gun you want. In fact, John Sutter bought 40 cannons from the Russians and drug them overland to Fort Sutter, called himself a captain and set up his own militia. And the Mexican government never said a word to him. They didn't care. And then in 1850, from 1850 on, for 163 years, in one form or another, it was lawful and legal in California to openly carry a weapon. For 118 years, until 1968, you could carry a loaded weapon and walk straight into the state capitol building and no one would even look at you funny. And I remember my dad used to do it all the time. I can remember going to the grocery store and he had his 38 on him and well, nobody even looked at him funny because half the other guys had theirs too. Had a rifle in the back of his truck too. And everybody had one of those. When we were little kids, we used to take our guns to school. And we'd stack them up in the office, and they were loaded. I mean, we didn't unload them and take them to school. We were dumb kids. We took them loaded, and we'd lean them up in the office, and after school, we'd go get them and go out and shoot rabbits. I was on the rifle team in high school. I took my rifle to school with me. So did lots of kids. Everybody had a shotgun in the back of their trucks. So you could go shoot doves or ducks after school. No one cared. No one cared. In 1968, the Black Panthers had a little demonstration in the Capitol in Sacramento. They took uh, old pistols and a couple of M1 uh, carbines and some shotguns, and they went into the Capitol. And here's what happened. And they were asking for directions to the gallery. Okay. 20 Black Panthers went into the state capitol with guns, and you know what? There, there was no panic. No one called the police. They went to the usher and asked directions to the gallery. Well, if he was really afraid, he might not have given them to him, huh? But he made a mistake. He told them to go through the wrong door. And instead of going up into the gallery so they could protest going like this with a gun saying, um, you know, whatever they wanted to say, he let them into the assembly chamber itself. And that's where the bad things happened. No one was shot, no one was hurt. The state police came when they asked these guys to leave. And I got my own opinion about the Black Panthers, but this isn't about them, it's about guns. Um, and they left. No one got hurt, no shots were fired, nothing bad happened. But right after that, Governor Ronald Reagan, champion of liberty, and Assemblyman Don Mulford from Oakland, they were so mad that they introduced 28, uh, 25850 and stripped every one of you of your constitutionally guaranteed ability to carry a loaded weapon exposed. That's when we lost our liberty, and you know what? The NRA helped write that bill and nobody said a word. Wow, I mean, the silence was deafening. And then in 2012 and 2013, little Anthony Portentino, the illustrious state senator from Glendora, California, who was the art director on the Grizzly Adams TV show, so his creds were, were way up there. He was in the entertainment industry. 
He said, you don't need a gun to go buy a cheeseburger. And they outlawed the open carry of an unloaded weapon, which is what we used to do. We'd carry the gun on this hip and the magazine on this hip. That was legal. It wasn't great, but at least you still had the thing if you needed it. I used to do it all the time. And then you couldn't even do that. So now, you can't carry concealed without a permission slip, and you may or may not get that one, and it's not your right anyway. And you are barred by law from carrying open. So I sued him. And uh, the court hearing was supposed to be yesterday, but guess which judge we drew? Judge Mueller. Guess what she did? She did like she did in the CFR case. She waited till within a few days of the hearing and then changed the date so that we wouldn't fill the courtroom with people. So we had a rally yesterday, which was supposed to be court. Several hundred people showed up. We're going to do it again on October the 8th on the steps of the courthouse. And we will rally again and again and again because the liberty that they have taken is my gift from my God. And I will not squander it while I have breath in my body. I'm, I would ask you to help us participate in that case. I know, you know, I know like everybody else, my wife and I are in the same boat. We're a small business owner. Our rear end is an inch off the ground. The bucket's pretty much dry. We have no place to go but up from here. But we better be prepared to fight for it. You know, we used to have an old dog, and uh, Little Tugs was a great guy. He didn't get too far when he got old. He was pretty close to the table. He, he didn't know he wasn't free. He never got to the end of the chain. He was just too tired. He thought he was really free. But had he got up at a dead run and, made a, and lit out for the fence, he'd have realized that that chain has an end. And that he was only as free as the chain allowed him to be. And that's how you are in the state of California. You get up and you go to work and you eat your breakfast and you eat your dinner and you turn your TV on and you don't even know that if they want to come and get your stuff, they can do it any day they want to. And just because they haven't done it yet doesn't mean they won't or can't. And the Second Amendment is your individual gift, your guarantee from God Almighty that you don't have to go quietly when they come to get your stuff or that when you're in the, the market or the park and someone makes a move toward your loved ones or your family, that you can't defend them from that evil. And look, the reason we're in California, in this state right now, is because evil is in charge. I mean, Governor Newsom is a fe federal felon, Title Eight, Section 1324, harboring and shielding an illegal alien. Everybody in the California Senate's a felon, Title 8, 1324, harboring and shielding an illegal alien. If you did that, you'd go to jail. Why don't they go to jail? Because they think they're above the law, and they've demonstrated it. And what we need to do, and what we have the opportunity to do, is create a state where everyone has liberty, everyone. And everyone has liberty through adequate representation one state senator for each county, or multiples of one for each county, and a representative for every 2,500 to 5,000 people. No more than 5,000 per representative to be determined by Constitution. With a part-time legislature, where every two years they work on the budget, and every, other, every odd year they work on legislative matters, and no legislator is allowed to introduce more than one bill a year and where we have an Office of Constitutional Review. If the bill doesn't pass muster constitutionally, it doesn't even get introduced. That's what we want, liberty. And we can have it if you all stand up and help me take it, because they're not going to give it to us. We have to fight. I, I have one job in the Constitution, and I'll close. Just one. There's only one job in the United States Constitution that an individual can accomplish. And I'm here before you not because I'm a big shot. I'm here before you because I'm a failure. I failed to do that one job. I failed to succeed in that one area. And that is to secure for myself and my posterity liberty. It is my oath and my duty to hand this, con this country off to my children in the same shape it was in when my father handed it to me. And I have not done that. So it is my mission, and I hope it will become yours, to serve God and glorify God 
by securing to myself and my posterity the liberty that he gave me and that no man and no government has the jurisdiction, ability, or authority to take from me while I am alive. Liberty is the most important thing. Liberty first, liberty last, liberty always. Because without liberty, they're not going to let you keep the money or the property. Thank you very much.